All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for this uh, our first event online. We have some amazing guests with us. Uh, we have Rajiv, Amy, and Christian. Um, and I think we should just get right into it. Uh, I'm sure people start coming in, but I just want us to start with kind of the different faith journeys that you have and more the starting point of those. Like, what was it like kind of growing up and the transition to where you are now? Uh, Rajiv, would you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, so I grew up Seventh-day Adventist, I'm third generation on my mom's side. And um, they converted in India. Missionaries showed up and were like, hey, opportunity. And then, you know, my family, both on my mom's and dad's side, were also like, hey, opportunity. We have this connection now to the United States, an educational opportunity. Um, being a low caste person, um, educational and work opportunities weren't plentiful. So the chance to have have that brought to us was something the elders in my family couldn't couldn't walk away from. And then I grew up in the United States, emigrated when I was two years old, grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, um, went through Seventh-day Adventist schools from K through 16, so graduated undergrad from an Adventist college, um, got married right out of college. And I, I, I followed the playbook perfectly. And, and then in, in uh, and, and my spouse uh, is also generational Seventh-day Adventist and miraculously we're still together through major transition. And in our early thirties, we, things began to unravel theologically. Questions just weren't holding up and we were no longer willing to just dismiss them as well. It's our limited understanding or well, we should just trust, trust the establishment and say, you know, we, if, if we want to be people of faith, we have to own it. And if we can't actually justify it to ourselves, how dare we propagate it and promote it to anybody else? So, and we were both employed by the church. We were both educators in the Seventh-day Adventist school system, which is the second largest parochial school system in the world, um, just a little more quiet than the Catholics. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, we lost careers, we lost friendships, um, very strained family relationships to start with. Those have begun to heal, um, and, and many are healed, uh, although they're still practicing Seventh-day Adventist. So um, that period of darkness, which I think a lot of the listeners of the What the Faith podcast and the podcast uh, Bonnie and I work on, you're reaching out. And, and the, the biggest message that we try to, to get across is you're not alone. You're not the first one that's had this fall apart on you. Um, and there is another side. It's, it's not easy going, but, but there is another side. Um, so today, you know, a lot of the scars are, are pretty well healed over for me. There are still some tender spots that are surprising when they show up. Like right now, when people talk about the end times, which is like, all of Adventist theology was about the end times. And now when that comes up, I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I, you know, this sounds eerily like right. <laughs> but, um, you know, balancing a lot of that with with the uh, the growth and understanding has been has been fun during these odd, odd and scary times. Yeah, thank you, Rajiv. That's uh, that's a lot. <laughs> that's our I know all the stories are. Um, I asked just to, to keep moving. Uh, we can ask Amy if you wanted to share your experience. I was raised Mormon, and a similar story. Like I say, we those of us who've left sing a similar song. I I was what we refer to as a true blue Mormon, all in, on the path, the good girl who kept all the rules, did all the things, and got married at 20 after a year at Brigham Young University in Utah. And if we have any um, ex-Mormons, they know the story well. <laughs> but um, yeah, I did all the things and obeyed all the rules, like I said. And my faith crisis kind of started in pieces, but I'd, I refer to it as my faith crisis started in full force in 2006. And by then I was married and had a few children 
and living the Mormon lifestyle, which is a culture, which most of you can relate to. And felt very alone when we refer to it as the shelf, when you have all these doubts and you just kind of put them on the shelf. Like, well, polygamy, for example, is in Mormon's history, Mormon present too, if you, if you really know the theology. And um, put it on the shelf and just figure I'll deal with it later. And after years and years of doing that, the shelf just comes crashing down. I kind of refer to it as like the Jenga puzzle. Just your etch a sketch of life. <laughs> you just have to wipe it clean and, and start rebuilding. So, yeah, so I, 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 everything you were saying, I was wanting to respond to because I could, I could relate to the things you were talking about, but just through the more inside of things. So now I spend my life helping people navigating the space in between leaving and whatever's next for you. That's great. I love that that term of putting it on the shelf. I'm sure, sure. you can all relate to that at some point of like, oh, like, oh, I'll just ignore that and put that up there. Um, <laughs> yep. on the shelf I don't look at. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, um, Christian, we'll save it for another day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Christian, would you uh, like to share your story of kind of where you came from? Sure, Ashton. Thank you for having me, uh, first of all. And uh Thanks to Amy and Rajiv for sharing your stories. Mine is a little bit different. I didn't leave my faith. Um, I reframed it, which is how I've gotten to the point where I am. Um, I was born into the National Baptist Church, which is a you know predominantly black Baptist organization. So my transition was birthed in a place of privilege because I'm black, I'm male, and I'm heterosexual, I'm cisgendered. So all of those characteristics gave me a lot of privilege in my upbringing. And it was in seminary where I started to be challenged. And I was challenged with the lived experience of many of my classmates. And also their, their worldview was drastically different from mine. And I began to see so much more clearly how my faith tradition uh, marginalized other people. And that just wasn't something that I could stand for. So as I went through my theological evolution, uh, I began to truly embrace LGBTQ plus affirmation, uh, which in my tradition is where the buck stops. Right. <laughs> Um, it's a huge issue in my tradition. And actually, it's a huge non-issue. It's the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about, but it's ever present. So I took the leap to talk about it. And in doing that, I had to start really critiquing the Bible in ways that my tradition was not comfortable with. So I went from being a ascending itinerant preacher to where I was, I had standing invitations annually at churches across the country. I went through my theological evolution publicly and my schedule shrunk down to nothing. Uh, and that led to me starting the faith community, which is my church start here in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I wrote a book about it as well because I curated a brand of theology called Greatest Commandment Theology, which is rooted in the words of Jesus. I feel like the Western Christian church has lost sight of the historical Jesus. Yeah. We have latched on to the Jesus we've created. So my book is called Breaking All the Rules. Uh, and it's an ancient framework for modern faith. So I'm just trying to get back to the root of what I believe Jesus was trying to do instead of what we've fabricated in our modern day. That's awesome. I think that reframing, and like, because <clears throat> I think that's such a huge part of hanging on to, because I mean, there's certainly things that hurt from our past that we wish, you know, we had done or hadn't believed. But then also hanging on to some of those things that we do realize is useful, I feel like is one of the biggest challenges mm -hmm. that a lot of people face. Um, and since, you know, so many faith journeys are, we have so many different ones that we face, you know, like 
We have Rajiv with Seventh Day Adventist, whose parents converted from India, aiming at Mormonism and a restructuring of your faith, reframing. Um, what were maybe we could each go around and talk about the biggest challenge that we had to faith, ah, face and our faith shift. Um, uh, Rajiv, would you want to start sure. us off? Um, the, the, I think the biggest challenge was was logistical for me. I, I tend to be a person who hangs on. It, 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 it was sort of like the solid thing that had chips in it. And then at, at a point, it, it's like a ball of yarn unraveling and unraveling quickly. So that the falling away was very, very fast. But being um, at, at the time, I was a principal of a K-12 school. Um, Bonnie, my spouse, she also worked at that school. So we were we had two kids. Um, one was about to head into high school. One was entering late elementary, middle school. And so logistics of we're going to lose we're going to lose our careers. You know, we built up these careers over the, the last 15 years. Um, our social circle was going to probably dissipate. And to that point in our life, we had never really had to function fully outside of the church. Outside of the church. Outside you know, family, outside friends, outside. employment were all, all mixed in with Seventh Day Adventism. So I, I would say what's unique maybe about my experience is the logistical obstacles of moving into a new income source, uh, new social structures, uh, gauging whether friendships were real or just based on um, mimicry. And, and, uh, but I, I, I think probably a common thread between many of us is, is the losses of, you know, the personal losses, family strain, et cetera, which wasn't uncommon to, to other people's transitions. But those, those were hard. Those were hard. And I'm grateful to the people who have been willing to stay in relationship with me and, and truly be, be friends where I get to be my authentic self. They get to be their authentic self. And we have that shared history of growing up Seventh-day Adventist, which, you know, you can't replicate that, that history. So I'm grateful to those people. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, I feel like that's definitely a rare commodity to have a friend uh, that is able to stick through you uh, through that time. Um, yeah, that, and that logistical part of finding new jobs is always, I think, one of the scariest, especially as somebody grows older. That can be one yeah. of the scariest. Parts. I wasn't that old um, at the time, but uh, <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be harder now. It'd be a scary thing now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, Christian, would you like to talk about what kind of your biggest struggle was? I think there are going, going to be a lot of parallels between our stories because anytime you transition in your beliefs, you sacrifice relationships because a lot of the people with whom you were in relationship uh, were there because you agreed with them. And the minute they find out you don't agree, then they sever the relationship. So that was the biggest challenge for me. I remember, like I said, my my evolution started in seminary because my parents taught me to think critically about everything but my faith. So I was a critical thinker in every aspect of life. But when it came to my faith, I regurgitated everything I was fed. And I could do that really well. So that's why I was, you know, getting invitations to preach. I found creative ways to regurgitate the stuff everybody else was saying. And I got in seminary and started asking questions that my faith tradition did not encourage me to ask. Because, you know, in, in my tradition, you know, people will say, you know, the, the seminary is a cemetery. And, you know, don't don't go there and get all that learning and lose your burning. Uh, so this was everybody's fear with with me getting educated in this way i remember sitting in classes and we were discussing these ideas and it was just like 
wow, nobody ever told me that. And everybody in the room agreed that makes total sense. But this completely shifts the paradigm in which we were raised. But then so many of my classmates would say, you can't say that in the pulpit, though. Like you can't you can't take that back to your church. And I'm sitting there like, why the hell not? Like, you want me to get this and then go lie to the people? I said, I'm not I'm not doing that. So I had to figure out a way to be true to myself and tell people the truth and just see who was going to come along. And a lot of people didn't come along. So I had people who I call family who I mean, I, I, I've been called some of everything. Uh, witchcraft, the Antichrist, the heretic. I actually embraced the moniker the heretic on my podcast. That's my moniker on my podcast. Because I was called it so many times. I was like, so I know what heresy means, but let me go and look up the definition. And the definition blessed me. The root definition of heretic is someone who holds views or opinions that are contrary to what is widely accepted. I said, you know what? I am a heretic. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and I didn't go over that. So it was a loss of relationships that was significant. Yeah. I like uh, somebody commented, Ariana said, I think in transition, you also discover that some relationships weren't really relationships at all. In that case, they don't end; they just vanish. Um, I think that's that's a lot of truth. That's that's right so there. true. Like I feel like I've talked about. I feel like I disappeared to some people. But we did get a question, so uh, maybe I can send this out to you guys, and anybody can answer it. Uh, I just want to answer this question from Mike Henry. Did any of you lose relationship with your children, and if so, how did you deal with it? So my kids were in, like I said, moving into middle school and moving into high school at the time we left. And um, we actually, we, <laughs> my, my partner and I, we, we co-host two different podcasts. One is a progressive Christian podcast. One is one specifically for Fringe and former Seventh-day Adventists. And we've had a couple of episodes where we talk specifically about the process of parenting in, in the journey. Um, and I, I can send you those links that if anybody's interested, you could hear them, but they were young enough. They couldn't really do anything about it. And, and I don't mean that in a, a negative way or authoritative way, but it, it was the reality, you know, they needed their parents for their housing, for their food, for transportation. So what we did was what we did and they had to come along. It wasn't till their late teens, early 20s, that some of the anger, frustration, um, and pain that they incurred at the time of that transition really surfaced. And all of us have participated in therapy, and I encourage anyone going through a faith transition to get good quality therapy, not the hack you know, in a church basement therapy, get, get professional therapy. Um, so these things were coming forward and that was really painful to, to hear from your pretty much young adult children about how much the way we handled it hurt them at the time and how that pain stayed with them and manifested in various ways. And, you know, some of the factual details I think were incorrect, but it doesn't mean they didn't suffer. Um, so we've worked really hard with them at kind of owning the mistakes that we made, um, hearing them out the best we can without being triggered and without being defensive. And I would say today our relationship is really good. You know, our, our kids are 24 and 27. Um, they both have finished college and, you know, now they're trying to find work that matches their ex expertise. But um, the relationship is good. There are moments that still pop up and that, that still sting. But overall, it's been great. And, and both of them, you know, both Bonnie and I are now progressive Christian ministers in the United Church of Christ. Our younger son considers himself a devout but very liberal 
progressive minded Christian. Our older son is like, nope, not having any of it, but he's spiritual. He's just very, he's like old, old prehistory spiritual, um, which some stuff that he studied. So that that's great. Um, and, and to actually have mature conversations around our faith beliefs as they have evolved is, is a real gift. Uh, Cause I do know families where the families have really fractured. So I'm grateful, but I'll tell you, it, it took, it was not easy to hear the pain that our children, that we caused our children. You know, I, I'd like to say we, we didn't cause it, you know, it just happened. But the truth is we were the parents, we were in charge. We controlled a lot of their lives uh, and those decisions. So that was hard. It, it, it was really hard. And thinking about it is difficult, but uh, grateful that we've been able to stick together, stay close, and even grow closer over time. Yeah, that's, uh, I, mean, I feel like that's gotta be one of our, I don't have kids, uh, fortunately not yet. And um, I think that would just be, I mean, knowing how, the, you know, what happened with my parents and as a kid losing my parents, whether it's, um, even though they stayed in the faith and I left, that was definitely probably the hardest part uh, to deal with. And also I know talking to one of our guests on our podcast, talking about leaving, uh, being an evangelical uh, and his kids are still evangelical and the relationship, you know, he stays in that, in the Bible belt so that way he can maintain that relationship with them and still be around them. But it's still at, at such a tension. Um, we have another question that came in. If you could communicate to the church, you were a part of uh, about one single thing, what would it be? And that was from Sierra, which is a great question. Uh, Christian, you want to take this one first? Yeah, um, I don't. I don't know if there is one single thing because it's, it's such a loaded question. Like faith, spirituality, theology, all that stuff tends to like it. It's it permeates every aspect of our our lives. So to have one single thing is just too difficult. Um, I wrote one single book <laughs> to try to convey what was on my heart. And at the core of that book is that for Christians, for those who claim to be Christians means we're trying to be like Jesus. We're trying to follow in the way of Jesus. So as I look at the information we have on Jesus, he was very, very clear in who he came to reach and how he planned to reach them. And he rooted it in the greatest commandment, which I love because the greatest commandment is not unique to Jesus. Uh, his, his, his ministry and his life and his story spread the greatest commandment in, in many ways, but it's not original to him. The greatest commandment is mentioned in the Bible before Jesus ever walks the earth. And of course, Judaism is not a, an original, uh, uh, faith tradition because Judaism borrowed from traditions that came before it. But Jesus says the greatest commandment in all of the law is to love God with your heart, your soul, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, everything in the law, everything in the prophets hinge on these two. So sometimes when I talk to other Christians, they try to separate love for God and love for neighbor as self and say, well, you got to love God first. But that's not how Jesus said it. He said, everything hinges on these two. So it's not two separate commandments is one commandment with two parts and you cannot love God outside of the lens of loving your neighbor as yourself. And see, that's why I say you can't just say one thing because it just keeps on going. <laughs> so if I had one thing, it would be to truly unpack and understand the implications of the greatest commandment. You can't love God if you don't love your neighbor. You can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. And 
It's just unpacking all of that. Yeah, I, I agree. The one thing, I mean, it's it maybe impossible, but in order to, I mean, the way I would answer that in the here and now, probably in the future, would be the church needs to, I don't know if this is a, a PG rated show or if we can say what we, you know, or what your restrictions are. So I'll, I'll try to keep it PG 13. The church needs to destroy at the root toxic masculinity and male supremacy at the root, because I believe our, our misogyny, our anti queer perspectives come from that sense of entitlement and superiority. And Christian, I really appreciate your realization in seminary, which is one that, that I share, I can identify with that recognition that my heterosexuality, my cisgender presentation, you know, I have a, a deeper register. Um, people gave me shit that I didn't deserve. They just handed me the microphone. And I wasn't saying anything new. I was just saying it. And, and so to have to unpack that and then actually come to terms with the fact that my entire formation up to that point was really worthless. I hadn't earned anything. And then to, to discover then as a person of faith, as somebody who wants to be spiritual and to be a leader, I, I believe I'm called into leadership. Uh, how do I do that in an authentic way and embrace the community of my queer siblings in ministry female sibling in ministry and, and folks from all, I mean, intersectionality. So that one thing, I, the church has got to destroy at the root toxic masculinity and male supremacy as part of the culture. We have to resist that. If we don't, nothing's going to really change. And if I can add one more thing to that, that is beautifully stated. If there was like to add on to what I said, one thing the church needs to do, the Christian church, is undeify the Bible. I don't think we need to decentralize the Bible. I'm really cool with the Bible being central. The Bible has some of the greatest wisdom the world has ever known. It also has some of the most horrific acts the world has ever known, all in the same collection of writings. So I believe we need to undeify the Bible. The challenge there is if we undeify the Bible, what is the uh, objective truth on which we will stand? I say it's the greatest commandment. And we use that as our framework for how to live out our faith. I, I think that's a super great point. Um, I know I know for me, and I, I think it kind of goes with the greatest commandment of love God, and then the second grace is to love your neighbor. Um, of like when communicating back to the church, when I think about it, it's always so like, I don't know what, I don't even want to talk to them. Like I, it's like, it's just become this uh, idea really that like Lord's over these people that, I mean, even the people running these shows, when it says, I'm not even sure if they're, they could have been tricked a long time ago too. I, you know, I don't know. They might think, I don't know, but it's like these people, it's more the people that I wish I could say, just get one word in to the people that are really just good hearted people that I know that I just think haven't maybe seen the world or gotten out and seen what else there is like humanity and what humanity has to offer through different types of faith and how valid they can be. Do you think education plays a role in shifting beliefs? A pivotal time in my journey was when I decided to pursue religious studies in college. I think that's a great question. I think absolutely yes, and I think it's important. Education is 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 central, and and taking a critical lens, not not a negative lens, but a critical lens to everything that you take in and and hope to internalize. You've got to examine that, turn it upside down, and challenge it. You know, one of the groups that my wife and I co-led for many years for ex Seventh Day Adventists, um, we would ask questions like, "Where was your turning point?" And what's interesting, it wasn't the majority, but the most frequent answer was I took a cultural anthropology class. That was like the one thing that seemed to be consistent. Folks realized, hey, there's this is a human experience. Religious exploration, existential questioning is a human experience. It's not unique to, 
to my limited perspective. So education is key. You got to do it. Got to do it. Otherwise, you know, there's no challenge without it. I totally agree with Rajiv. Uh, I think the key also is how you approach your education. So where are you being educated? Because oftentimes if we seek theological education, certain institutions were created simply to reinforce indoctrination. So you have to be clear about where you're going and why you're going, because for, for example, you know, going back to the question earlier about, did you, uh, have any breaking relationship with your kids. I didn't have any breaking relationship with my kids, but there was a struggle with me and my mom as her son, uh, because my mom has theological education. But when she started participating in my ministry, it deconstructed everything she learned in seminary. Every single thing she thought she knew was completely deconstructed in my small group because a lot of what she learned in seminary reinforced what she was taught growing up and they didn't necessarily encourage her to ask those questions, which is why I appreciate my school. I'm gonna give a shout out to McAfee School of Theology at Mercer University uh, because McAfee did not tell me what to believe. McAfee gave me the permission to ask questions and they equipped me with the tools to do my questioning experiment. So then I was able to take that in and say, okay, now that I have these tools, what am I going to do with them? And I just started asking questions that people told me before that I couldn't ask. And then the more people told me I shouldn't ask them, the more I wanted to ask them. And my, so my education was pivotal. Without my education, I'm not here today. That's really powerful. I feel like the uh, Allison gave a comment. Um, I think for me, yeah, that's a that is a really good point because that was the hardest thing for me is I didn't get to go to college and with Joe's witnesses, I think that really keeps people stuck in it a lot is because they don't like you can technically go to college, but lots of people will even get like reproved, which is like kind of a public. So and so is reproved, which could be literally they could have done anything wrong. Um, but yeah, that was a hard thing of getting out and like not having money, so not really being able to afford college. Um, but just I think the the key was critical thinking, and like trying to take in whatever sources can give critical thinking, um, and just challenging like every thought that I could. I think it was like the key, and what like college I hope is supposed to do um but i think education on that level of just critically thinking question things is uh is a huge help i've got a comment from amy that is powerful uh, she mentioned that she has one child in the church um who just got home from his mormon mission and then one child out of the church that is, I mean, I can't even imagine the, uh, the trials and what there is to go through that. Um, thank I, you for I, sharing. I, mean, I, want, oh. I want to throw in a personal request to Amy. I'm, again, I'm, I'm like so sad this isn't working. It, I would, I'm going to follow your podcast. I'm going to subscribe and follow it. If you could do, if you haven't already, do an episode on that parenting perspective. Um, it, it, with whatever you could share, I would be all over that because that's that's really important. Yeah, definitely, that'd be great, and I and I hope too. I we can get Amy on the podcast too, so that way we can get a recorded. Um, what we've missed uh, having her on this on this uh, event, so I, I am really sorry, and I hope that we can uh, get to hear your story and what you what you go through because that I know is going to be so powerful, uh, is so powerful. Um, yeah. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. And we got her info in the chat now. So now we can all follow her podcast. Um, I guess to move forward, though, um, I think that was really powerful about the education. 
Are we going to get another question? Was there a specific incident that got you on your path today, or was it a gut feeling? I guess what I guess to boil it down simpler is what what did get you on your path that you're on today? I'll take a stab at that one. I can actually recall that aha moment. Uh, it was exploring human sexuality. I'm very I'm very comfortable with my sexuality. I wasn't affirming, but I wasn't bashing LGBTQ people. I was just like, hey, I think it's wrong because that's what I was told. I, don't know. I mean, it just is. And it was unnatural to me. So like, hey, it makes sense for it to be wrong. And then I started to actually explore deeply. Um, part of it was my sister being gay. And and what I did, what I did that really started me on my journey is I dealt with the notion that gay people choose their sexuality. And I said, OK, well, wait a minute. What if I applied that to myself? Did I have a choice? And I realized in that moment, I didn't choose my sexuality. I just discovered it. I just knew one day I like girls. It wasn't like I went out to the playground and said, OK, do I want to, you know, be romantically involved with the boys or the girls? I just knew I like girls. So I started going through this process of. Well, if I didn't choose my sexuality, why are we putting that on LGBTQ plus people saying that they chose it? So once I dealt with the fact that sexuality is not a choice, but it's something you discover, then the floodgates open. I'm like, OK, so what's all this bullshit I'm getting in the Bible like? Let me start unpacking all of this. Let me start reading some other resources. And that's how I came to this understanding of like biblical criticism and undeifying the Bible, because you can make an argument for whatever you want to make an argument for using the Bible. I can make an argument for genocide using the Bible. I can make an argument for stoning women who commit adultery uh, by using the Bible. I can make an argument for anything. So I was like, is this too expansive? We need to kind of narrow this down a little bit. So and, and that's what my book does. My book, it challenges us to replace the default question. What does the Bible say about that? And replace that with how does the greatest commandment apply here? So people at my church know, don't just throw a scripture at me. It, it, out of context, because if you take a text out of its context, all you have left is a kind. So don't don't just throw scriptures at me like, well, how does the greatest commandment apply to this? How are you loving your neighbor as yourself? Are you truly loving yourself in this moment? And when you look at it in that context, it changes everything. So for me, it was exploring sexuality and it's not a choice. So then I just started to go down that rabbit hole and here we are. Yeah, we, um, I, I, I guess I would say I had two distinct stages of the leaving process. One was my own theological understanding, which again, when the unraveling began to happen, it happened fairly quickly. And then it was like, you know, here I was, I was an administrator in Seventh-day Adventist school I had the opportunity to serve on regional, like Western states, regional bodies of groups of other educators who were trying to, who had influence over curriculum decisions and guidelines. So I made a proposal at this meeting, which we were asked to make a proposal. Uh, and I wanted to open up dialogue, official dialogue around sexuality, biblical interpretation, like real science needs to be in our schools. We should be doing other things, taking our role as educators seriously. And um, I was told at the end of that meeting by one of my direct supervisors, they were like, you know, you're not the only one that thinks that. But if you keep talking about that, you won't last long. Um, you have a bright future with us. Just keep it to yourself and everything will be fine. So at that, you know, I just knew that that 
that wasn't going to work. I, I don't know how to operate that way. Um, so that was it. So the theological unraveling happened first, but I was hopeful because I knew lots of people had same the same kinds of questions to have an official like blessing from, you know, our Western states educational governing body to go, you know, we need to, I wasn't even asking to do anything, just have official conversations about what we could do differently in order to better meet the needs of the students in our care. And, you know, that, that was the end for me as, as an employee. I mean, I, I resigned later that week and served out the rest of my contract, which was the rest of that school year. And, and that was it. That's, that was a really great experience. I mean, both of you are a, I almost feel envious because you, you both were so much smarter and came into your own realization also with Amy talking about her gut feeling that she had about the problems in her church. For me, it was so sudden. I was, I was devout up until the end until they disfellowshipped me for a, a sin I caused. And I, it, that hit me so hard because I had, after I repented, I was like, okay, I'm going to like follow all their rules. I'm going to be as selfless as possible. I'm going to pray to God, like, you know, as for the entire day, if I can, you know, and went through all of it. And then they said I was out. And if anything, I feel like that told me that, well, like God wanted me to be out. If there's a God out there and there is that power out there, like, he got me out because I was I was doing everything I could for my prayed in a in a way that I'd never prayed before and you know full on like body sweats crying and it was definitely like oh like maybe I was supposed to be out like maybe and that really helped me move forward from there and start questioning. Um but I wish I was smarter like you guys earlier on. <laughs> that would have saved me a bit of a a bit of a journey for sure. Um we did get another question. Uh, da, 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 da. these questions have been great and so I really really thank you to all the people watching um, for the questions oh it's from Allison so we know it's going to be a really good one uh, where are you at now when it comes to organized religion and she says Rajiv I believe you've become a pastor as well what was that reconstruction process like yeah that's that's a thank you for asking that because I, I don't often get to go there and I avoid it frankly it's like hard for me to talk about being a pastor <laughs> given my journey. And I am in a denomination, the United Church of Christ. It's a small denomination, but uh, an old historic denomination in or roots uh, way back to early New England. Um, and again, it's a liberal denomination. We're the first to ordain a woman, first to ordain an openly gay minister, um, have been hugely, in, were, were hugely involved in the civil rights movement, are currently involved in a lot of uh, activism. My local church, we were one of the first churches to put up a Black Lives Matter sign. Uh, when Trump issued the travel ban on Muslims, we put up a big banner that says, we love our Muslim neighbors. So for me, if I, if I, wasn't, a, if I wasn't at Parkside Community Church in Sacramento in the United Church of Christ, I would not be in ministry. I mean, this is a church that it, it wants us to take a firm stand. I mean, there's other UCC churches that might theologically be aligned, but they wouldn't allow for their ministers and the membership to take a powerful stand on really important issues. Um, so for me, it's it, it was a narrow window of opportunity, and I'm glad I was invited in uh, to be in this role. Um, but you know, it's it's a recent role for me. I left ministry in the Bay Area. I returned to nonprofit leadership, which is what I did after leaving education. And um, I knew I wouldn't last long in most churches, uh, even progressive minded churches. Um, so having this opportunity is, is great. So um, but then to come back to organized religion to back up a little bit, I had a very clear list. It had to be inclusive. I didn't know churches could be non-credal. And when I found out the United Church of Christ is a non-credal faith, it's about community. There's values that hold the community together. You have to piece together your own creed. You know, we do some stuff together ritualistically, but it's on you to come up with. I mean, all of the adult ed classes, none of us agree on anything, but we love each other. We have different perspectives. The point is the journey. And, and so that brought me, gave me enough comfort 
to feel like the UCC was a good place for me as a member. And then when I went to seminary, um, on my first class on, on United Church of Christ Faith, Polity and Practice, the first lecture, uh, the professor says, she, she didn't ask a lot of questions. She was like, if any of you think or want to believe the same way you believe now, five years from now, this is the wrong church. If any of you want a top-down kind of modality, this is not your church. I was like, wow, these people actually want you to evolve spiritually and theologically. So that that for me was a a sign that I I, I was comfortable moving forward. And you know, here I am. Thank you, Rajiv. I appreciate that. I, not to skip you on that thought, Christian, but I really want to hear from Amy from uh, <laughs> just her thoughts on some of this past conversation. We've we've missed your voice. Well, and I'll just say it was operator error. So I'll just swallow that pill. And I've missed the last question. If you will let me know what the last question was, I'll pick up where you are. Well, honestly, I think we'd love to hear about your story with the children. I know that was okay. really, we'd really love your, your voice on that. Yeah, I think it's a huge piece. Like I love talking with, this is like, I love this kind of conversation. Um, I have two children, 23 and 21. And my faith crisis, they were 11, 12, right in that area, maybe a little bit, maybe, I don't know, it's a little blurry. And I remember when I was first going through it, I felt like I just had to keep my mouth shut. I had to just keep my thoughts and opinions to myself. And I don't know if that's tied to the patriarchy. Mormonism, very, Mormonism like most religions, are very patriarchal. And I thought, like, I don't know what to teach my kids because I don't even know up from down right now. Like, that rug was pulled out free falling for a long time. And eventually I started just sharing little things and ask, would start asking questions like, well, what do you think about this to start generating some critical thinking type skills, which were new to me. <laughs> and so as my kids went through high school, I did find that I was a much more, I mean, I've, oh, I've been a good parent. I've been a good mom. I love my children, but I felt like as I went through my faith crisis and kind of a lack of belief in anything specific, I had to count on myself in ways I didn't and their life choices were just as valid as my life choices, even as a teenager. And to, I was less judgmental of just them being kids and humans and, and what they might be seeing or, you know, part, um, experimenting with and just anything that a teenager might be going through. And my parenting my parental paradigm just seemed to shift and open and it was just such so more such more coming from a more loving place which should have been <laughs> the thing all along and so when i had one child who when he was in high school pretty much stopped going for the most part his father is still a member their father is still a member of the mormon church so they still get that side of things but and i'm no longer married to him but so they kind of get the both sides of a mom in, a dad, I mean, a mom out, a dad in. And when my younger son said he was going to go on a mission, I was able to take it from the, the viewpoint of he's going to have a good experience. He's going to meet people that are going to change his life. He's going to have a human experience serving in whatever capacity he does. And so when I was able to shift that from, oh my gosh, he's just going to be preaching all of this indoctrination to you know what, wherever he goes and he went to South America, it's going to be a beautiful experience. And being able to parent from that place, instead of so afraid of the indoctrination, it helped me so much because I realized no one at 20 could have told me to not get married in the Mormon temple. Like I would have just gone, yeah, whatever. I mean, because people, you know, my, my father had to stand outside the Mormon temple while I got married because he wasn't a member. So he couldn't, wasn't worthy to go in that's a whole other topic. But I, I feel like I became a better parent once I kind of took off. I don't know if I wasn't judgmental of my kids, but I felt like I was able to be like, they're going to be okay, no matter what. You know, I'm here. If if my younger son ever goes through a faith crisis, he now has a mom who knows the whole spectrum, who knows all the emotions. And my other son, he's pretty much agnostic as well. And as well as me, I guess I didn't say that here. I, I've landed in the agnostic area, <laughs> but um, yeah. I so I I it's very difficult though when you're going through your own 
faith crisis to then think, how are you going to raise humans when you don't know what to do? <laughs> and I think the biggest piece of all of this is allowing yourself to have compassion with yourself, allowing yourself to not be so hard on yourself that you don't have all the answers and that you don't have to have all the answers. We were taught very much, I'm sure, as, as you guys know, that we had an answer for where we were, why we're here, where we're going. And to be able to land in a place that's like, I don't know, but I'll figure it out as I go, feels so much better. So yeah, that parenting piece, and I do have a podcast on it. I did hear you say that, Rajiv, about that. I have talked a little bit about that just a few weeks ago. Um, but yeah, that that's a, the little bit that I have to say. I have a lot more to say about it, but we'll leave it at that today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy. That's a, that is super powerful. Um, it's so unique too of just, uh, I mean, I know a lot of people go through it, but I'm glad that we were able to hear from you on that. Cause that is, I mean, something that more and more people need to hear about that process and kind of mm -hmm. what to do. Um, yeah, we got, we got even more questions. Um, and I know we need to start wrapping it up, uh, with now that we have Amy on, I was hoping we could go maybe a few minutes over so that way we could hear a bit more <laughs> from her too, if possible. <laughs> Um, but we did get a recent one that looked really good by Mildeth Reyes. She said, do you feel any fear and shame for changing your faith, your faith and how did, or do you deal with it? Am I starting? Yeah, please do. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, yes. <laughs> I did at first. I mean, fear is a huge part. I mean, anyone who has to face their eternal damnation and walk straight towards it. Like, well, I guess I might be damned forever. Those of you who are here and have gone through it, I just, you are the bravest people I know because to face that kind of fear and walk through it when you don't know what's gonna happen when you open that door is hugely brave. So yeah, I did have a lot of fear. Uh, shame, I don't know. I was probably more guilt prone than shame prone. <laughs> But shame is shame is something that is a is a feeling we create for ourselves when we feel like we have to keep something in the dark. So the minute that I started speaking my story, and in 2012 I started my YouTube channel. It used to be called Soul Searching Girl. Now it's called, I don't know, Amy Logan Life Post Mormonism. But I mostly just speak now on my podcast. Once I gave a voice to my feelings and to the things I was going through, I didn't feel shame. I felt the opposite. I felt confidence. I felt like I was finding my voice. And even though I don't know all the answers, I was able to step into a new confidence that I never felt even as a Mormon, even though I felt like I had all the answers. It was like stepping into a space of like, well, I don't know what's coming next, but I'm going to be okay. And so not so much shame. I think guilt is a conditioned response to, to religion in general. I think that's something that probably a lot of us can relate to trying to obey all the rules and do it all right. But, um, yeah, fear and shame, their voices quieted as my actual voice expanded. That's great. Thank you. That's uh, I think definitely a, the, I like what you said about you didn't feel the shame as much because you found your voice. Mm -hmm. I think I'm sure others can relate to where you, sometimes when you, what you're trying to, on you outwardly believing, but it's not really what you like to live your life but you feel so split and so kind of being able to come together again is such a powerful feeling i feel like um, yeah and that's what authenticity is and when before when i felt like i had to say the right answers and do it within this framework and then i through my faith crisis felt like well that doesn't feel like me anymore and then to feel to feel like i had to um mute myself that didn't feel comfortable either so once i was able to make that gap and not that everyone has to go start a YouTube channel or a podcast in order to find their voice. But for me, it was very cathartic. It was a way to just let someone know they're not alone. Yeah, that's great. Um, another good question. Just I'd say about one more question and then we can kind of have a final wrap up of kind of what we're doing now. Um, this is from Grayson Hester. She says, now that we've broken away from mainstream churches, is there any hope for repaired relationship or the risk final? Amy, we'd love for you to start. Okay, I'll speak really <laughs> quick because this is a huge talking point for me with my clients. I'm, I'm a life coach. This is what I do. What happens is we leave the faith and then we want to be heard and understood from the community that we came from. 
and we expect them to be able to give it to us. And they're having their own paradigm. They're still in the paradigm that you're pulling away from. And so we often get mad at the community and we understand it because we felt betrayed. And one of you said that earlier, and that's a huge thing ex-Mormons feel too. They feel very betrayed by the organization, which then trickles down to your local congregation and your family when really they're still doing what they've always done. But because our paradigm has changed, we look at them like you should understand. And I always just say, they don't, they, they can't, they haven't walked in your shoes. They don't know what you're going through. And now as, as you see here, there's so many people who have gone through this. You know, you can find that love and understanding from people who have walked the journey. And by doing that, I think in turn, you are able to have love for the people and the community that you left. It's kind of a backdoor approach, but for me, that's what helped when I stopped having the expectation that they needed to fill that bucket for me. And I could, there were other people who, who did know and who fully understood what it was like. Once you find that, I think you can take the expectation off your tribe and eventually you can start loving them for who they are. And that's, I think, where the bridge is built. That's great. Thank you. Do it. Would I have either of you like to add something to that? Um, I'll, I'll say that I believe the relationships can be repaired. I think it'll take time. It takes time for people to come around. I've seen some people already come around. There were people who told me I was crazy five years ago who are now inboxing me, asking me questions because they want clarity. And I believe um, historically, when we look at the Christian church, it has gone through a reformation about every 500 years. And the last reformation was about 500 years ago. So we're, we're probably in the midst of a major reformation. And I believe the church will not die. Churches will die. But the church will not die. And we're in a period where I believe in this age of information coupled with an age of authenticity, the church is being reborn. And some of those relationships that have been broken, I believe, can be repaired. And then some people are going to die the way they are. And we just have to be OK with that and keep moving forward. That's great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um also, so before we before we wrap this up, I just have one more question to kind of talk about what we're doing now. For anybody listening, we have a What the Faith survey at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you're able to take that, that'll help us kind of guide our next events and kind of what we can do in the future so that way we can really make content that people really want to hear. Um, so yeah, kind of just and to wrap it up, I'd love to talk to you because I think one of the most exciting things about leaving faith or shifting faith um, is the fact that it helps us grow and then now we can do something unique and really powerful and help other people and so i really just like to hear from each of you kind of what you're working on now and uh you know where people can find your work and also what it is and how they can benefit from it rajiv would you would you like to start sure thanks um yeah, and thank you for the opportunity to share this. And and while I'm getting better at sharing this, I just want to acknowledge for myself that it feels awkward to be like a self promotionalist. Um, so I and and I share this because I think, as Amy said a few times, people shouldn't feel alone, and and in fact, you're not alone in this process. So, um, the, I, I co-host with four other folks. Uh, arenacast.com, which is a progressive Christian podcast, but all five of us co-hosts come out of evangelical fundamentalist backgrounds. So we sort of bridge together these things and we do a lot of unpacking. Um, the ex Seventh day Adventist podcast. If you grew up Seventh day Adventist, I don't know if there's any folks on this thing, but everyone knows what a haystack is. It's not a farming thing. It's basically a layered taco salad. You put chips at the bottom. If you're really good, you use Fritos at the bottom and then, you know, you put chili on it. So the, the podcast is called haystackspodcast.com. 
and we're on all the major um, uh, platforms for for podcasting. But you can find them all there. And an exciting thing that my wife is actually helping Coley that we've done a brick and mortar version, a live version of it's called Intersections which is a conversational group for people transitioning in their faith. Um, we are just about to put information out there, but if you go to haystackspodcast.com, you can message me there and I'll make sure I, I track your info and get it to Bonnie. Um, it's a six week session. You're in a fixed cohort. You make a commitment to stick it out for that. I think it's six or eight weeks. And um, you get to know each other, and, and that's a real sense of knowing you're not alone. And then the the church that I serve, Parkside Community Church, that website is parksideucc.org, a very inclusive church. Right now we're forced to be online, and we're finding a lot of joy in that because folks are joining us from other parts of the country because we're a little funky, we're different, we're um, very social justice-minded, and we're, we're available online 24 seven right now. So those are ways you can, you can get through um, and hopefully not feel alone. And if you know an ex seventh day Adventist or somebody struggling, please send them our way. And I'm glad Christian and Amy and Ashton to have the three of you as resources now, because we do get calls like, Hey, I'm an ex J dub. Hey, I'm an ex Mormon or Hey, I'm, I'm Baptist and I'm trying to figure out what to do. So to have friends that are experts in these areas, it's nice to be able to, resource people more effectively. And and thank you, Ashton and Allison, for this opportunity. I I approached it with a lot of reverence and I'm grateful to have been here. It's been it's been amazing having you on. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um Amy, would you would you like to share yours? What you're what you've been up to? Yeah. So I have since 2012 been helping people navigate life after Mormonism. And I do get other ex Jehovah's Witness. I don't know if I've had an ex Seventh day Adventist, but you know, just, just different people, ex evangelicals for sure. Um, and that's what I do. I coach people. I have an eight week coaching program that I, I walk people through that I give them concrete tools that they can start applying and using in their life that help them feel not so much a victim. They feel more empowered. Um, they find help find their voice, you know, and, and to strengthen the relationships with the people that they love the most that those relationships may have, you know, been torn a little bit um, to help repair that. So um, I spend a lot of my time on my podcast, Ex Mormonology, um, Ex Mormonology podcast, but you can find the link, I think. It was Allison posted it there, um, amyloganlife.com. And yeah, I feel very strongly to help people because, because of feeling so alone, thinking, especially back in 2012, I didn't see a lot of women voices. And I thought if, if this YouTube channel can help a woman who's bawling her eyes out at two or three in the morning, then, then I've done, I've, I've helped someone. So that's how it all started. And now I've turned it into what I do every day. So that's where you can find me, amyloganlife.com. That is so great. Thank you so much, Amy. And Christian, would you like to talk about your current projects? Sure. Thank you. Uh, this has been great. I love hearing the parallels in our stories when we come from such drastically different backgrounds, but we have shared experiences, uh, which just shows how complex the human experience is but at the same time we're we're kind of having the same experience at the same time i love it uh you can find out whatever you want to find out about me at christianasmith.com um, i pastor the faith community uh, which is the church that i founded uh, based in atlanta uh, so if you go to christianasmith.com you can learn more about the faith community uh, I am the host and the leader of the Holy Smokes Cigars and Spirituality Movement. Uh, we are in the second season of our podcast. Uh, so uh, you can go to ChristianASmith.com and learn more about Holy Smokes. Also, I just I just uh, released my book, Breaking All the Rules. Uh, it is an ancient framework for modern faith. It's a quick read, about 110 pages very conversational. You can order that at christianasmith.com. We're currently in the pre-order phase where every book that's ordered from the website will be autographed before it's sent out. Uh, so whatever you want to find out about me, 
christianasmith.com and it'll take you in whatever direction from there. So thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Awesome. Thank you everybody so much for doing this. This has been so amazing and I'm so glad that we're all able to make so much progress in this kind of area of life and to kind of keep exploring this. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thanks also, Allison really is the brains behind this operation and made this all happen. So I just want to give a big round of applause and thank you to her as well. Um, she is absolutely amazing. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for everybody who joined us. Um, we hope you enjoy this and we're so grateful that you took the time out of your day to listen to us. So this has been awesome. Uh, I guess, guess that makes it goodbye. Uh, thank you everybody. This was amazing.